Cindy and welcome to Pearls of Liberty, June 4th, 2011. We are in bright springtime clothes now, but I was ready to wear winter clothes this morning because we in the Bay Area in California have had so much rain and wind that honestly our weather has been the equivalent of what we might find typical for maybe the end of February. and. We've been watching some YouTube videos that show what appears to be concentric rings where weather's developing, and the speculation is that that's due to harp. And I'm hoping this week to get a few minutes to put together a little video with some screenshots so that you can have some detail to see what we're talking about. But anyway, the sun is trying to come out today. We'll see what kind of a day we have. Do you have anything you want to say about harp and our weather? Yeah, I, I think I'll put a little bit just in perspective that it's not, we're not saying that the weather has to be typical every year and recognize that atypical weather does happen. You have highs and lows and unseasonal stuff in various places. It, always but it seems that we're in an area where this kind of stuff is beyond normal now the the harp rings that Cindy was talking about are mostly in the Midwest area maybe associated with some of the storm activity there very you know, likely that it, uh, at least some of them are man-made what's happening in California is extremely unusual and I haven't seen any good explanations of it I don't know that there are any explanations out there, I just haven't seen them. But you never, never get downpours like what we've had in the, the San Francisco Bay Area in June. And that's where we're in now, we're in the first week of June, and it was pouring cats and dogs, not just one time yesterday, but for off and on a couple hours at least. So something pretty unusual. Not sure what's behind that. We know that chemtrails are real, the cloud seeding is real, what the whole agenda is, we're relatively ignorant. I still have the, uh, we got the video on what in the world are they spraying by G. Edward Griffin, haven't had a chance to watch it yet, so maybe we'll be watching that this week and giving a report on that next week, but of course many people in the Truth and Liberty movement are familiar with this, we just haven't had the, the chance to look at the documentation and then that film and then Harp is a whole other area. So this is this stuff is very real, and we're seeing it impact our lives in very tangible ways right now. Sure, and Don is somewhat concerned about the grape crop up in Napa. It's having a downpour, not good for the little baby grapes. But we do this week. We actually want, kind of want to go in a more positive direction. Generally, uh, there are some things developing that we believe might have a significant impact on liberty in the positive sense. And one of those, one of the things that's developing, you may have heard of bitcoins. It's a new form of currency that is fairly organic and completely outside the control, as far as we know, of the central banks and has real potential to allow people to freely trade using a, a common currency. Right. Bitcoins, I've just learned about within the last couple of days. They've been around since I think it was started in 2008, but there's been a real increase in awareness in the last even few days, few weeks on Bitcoins and what they're about. It is a completely decentralized network. You could kind of compare it to BitTorrent in that it's uncontrollable really whenever you have the government trying to clamp down on some of the BitTorrent type sharing, file sharing type things, it's never been successful because new ones will pop up. And that's actually what we're talking about with the kind of distributed technology behind Bitcoin. And it is totally free, in other words there's no central authority that that charges any amount. Bitcoins are mined by a process that requires in some intensive CPU usage the database is of all these Bitcoin transactions is managed decentrally uh, across the broad network and it was developed by 
Now the name is sounds Japanese, but it may or may not be a Japanese person. It might be just a pseudonym. I can't remember it off the top of my head. But it's all open source, and it looks legit. It looks above board. Whether or not they have actually designed in enough intelligence to detect if if parties are in collusion to try to control this currency, I'm not sure. They do have, it's, it's known, an algorithm to see if one entity is controlling more than 50%, then it basically shuts down or goes into some kind of a, a, a different mode. We really like the idea, or I should speak for myself, I really like the idea behind this. It is, I, I am not a gold bug. But I am not, I am definitely a anti-Federal Reserve person also. And I like the idea of currency being valued by the value that people attach to it, not some so-called inherent value. And I found an amazing quote this week, actually from the, um, I think it was from von Mises, who said that there is no such thing as intrinsic value. The, the value is of anything is what humans attach to it and then the value is within our own thought process. So this, the thing of Bitcoin taking off is really an encouraging development in terms of people understanding real economic freedom. The, those that have been hoarding the gold, as I've said before, are going to control the gold. And what do you think they've been doing when we've had a, a fiat currency that's been disconnected from gold? They want us to go back to the gold standard, so don't fall into that trap. The, to find out more about Bitcoin, I think the best place to go is weusecoins.com. There's an excellent intro, intro video there, and there's also a little good bit of history. If it's not on that side, I'm not sure it may be. The, the, there was a good article in Activist Post this past week, and that's a blog that I trust a great deal, has good analysis and good information, and I'm looking forward to the feedback that people will be giving about Bitcoins, and I'm thinking about some of our online stuff, yeah, finding out what it takes to transition into accepting Bitcoins. Now, the other aspect of, the, of this kind of technology is that my, the question I have in my mind is, well, there's, there's one that I already mentioned, is can it be manipulated or controlled? And that's somewhat questionable. And the other one is, is this the casino gulag that Max Kaiser has been talking about? It's easy to get into a fake world where you're not dealing with real substances. What will indicate to me that Bitcoin is really going to be an effective alternative economy is if you get people that have real tangible goods and services involved in it. I'm thinking about such things as local organic food producers and maybe homemade clothing, things like that, that or services that would be along the lines of something like a, an auction. And I did see that there is some kind of Bitcoin auctions going on for real goods and services. So that will indicate to me how successful this is going to be. Most people are saying, or at least the sources I've read so far, don't seem to think that you will find major online presence people like Amazon and eBay, etc., accepting Bitcoins because they're so invested in the current system. What you'll more likely see is entrepreneurial startups from the ground up, people that don't have obligations to the current financial system, and that to me is, is great. We don't want to necessarily have to tie the two together. The other thing to consider is how do you exchange bitcoins for dollars. There is a way to do that. My hunch is that you're going to lose your anonymity when you when you exchange your bitcoins to dollars. I can't see a way to make that so that it's not traceable. But within the bitcoin system itself it does seem to be that it is not going to be uh, traceable. It's, it's true, anonymous, non-governmental commerce. Well that sounds really wonderful. So if you happen to be a small 
business person, a small publisher, if you are making movies, you any kind of a startup, any kind of a small business, you might like to look into bitcoins and begin to use them as currency and support the system. Hopefully the, the concerns that Don has are uh, unfounded, that the, the system can truly be protected from interference by the big banks and uh, we, can, we can just follow this and, and see where it goes. And some more hopeful news, again if you are a small business person, spe more specifically an inventor or an innovator, this week I read something uh, regarding not using patents and these ideas have come from one of the developers of, of uses of Brown's gas and I'll just <laughs> we've mentioned Brown's gas before this is from the same website uh, politically hot Brown's gas uses new pure water manufacture hydrated water for health detoxifying water atmosphere enhancement muscle relaxation and pain relief Speeding of healing of wounds, helping plants germinate and grow, neutralization of radioactive waste. Yes, that you heard it right. Creating new industrial materials, transmutation, and under that they say we've learned two ways of using Brown's gas to make materials that did not exist in the original samples. We can make metals from water, again, too politically hot to touch. But I, I actually wanted to read that, and of course there are other uses such as super efficient room heating, surface treatment of materials, and combustion enhancement. But I, I'm actually just introducing the other idea about patents by giving a little foundation about who this person is, these, these people are, who have these ideas about patents. They themselves are developing some very promising technology and they are not patenting them. Uh, here are some of the advantages of sharing. By sharing our research publicly, we are put in contact with like-minded people around the world who also share their ideas. This takes years off the research time to develop the best answers in the world. And they're saying that patents are limited. Patents are only good for about 20 years. Patents need to be separately patented in every country or companies in another country can use your ideas freely anyway with no compensation to you. Patent process can be costly, take a long time. Their approach is, we share the results with everyone by writing a book. Everyone benefits because each person that contributed gets the benefits of everyone else's contribution as well. This has turned into an awesome tool for developing technologies quickly. Patent-free sharing and open cooperation are vital to developing and implementing energy alternatives in today's suppressive environment. And they go on to say, it is the author's conclusion, having studied this effect of patent office suppression extensively, some technology is actively suppressed by the patent office. I guess there's no big surprise there. So, again, if you're an inventor, consider bypassing the patent process. And I'll put up a, an article that will contain more details on this and the website where you can go for more information. Do you have anything to add? Yeah, I do. I, a couple of thoughts. It's, I think, pretty intuitively obvious that if you're, the whole idea of patenting something tends to freeze development it protects, the original intention is to protect the inventor of the technology, but what, it, what happens is that it, people that begin to think that they have to patent something in order to get it to take off, they buy into this and they, it's, it's really about motivation by greed rather than motivation by trying to help humanity and believing that a blessing is going to come just from the work itself. So, yeah, there's definitely that. And a great example of this in action is what happened with Freon. Freon, as we know, was the, 
the coolant that's used in air conditioning systems and you know especially in automobiles as well as in, in any home or refrigeration technology and I believe it was Dow Chemical had the patent on this I think the patent was whatever however long it was I don't think 17 years might be longer well what happened when that patent was near running out you had this outcry about the ozone layer being depleted it turns out that that was all bogus science and the purpose of that bogus science was so that they could so that Dow Chemical could patent their new additive which was going to replace Freon so it was just a maintenance of a monopoly so once you get things going in that direction where you're endorsing a monopoly on this knowledge or this product then you have this tendency for the monopoly to continue and to, for lies to develop around the monopoly and a whole group of stuff like that so breaking out of the box into new paradigms is going to require that we let go of this greed motivation that comes from the whole idea of patenting and to just trust that you've been given if you've been given an idea that the idea is going to create a way for you not the government endorsement of the idea and generally the greed seems to flow I know there there are a lot of reasons for greed and the love of money is the root of all evil as the Bible says and so forth but a lot of times it, greed flows out of a feeling that there is lack but when we look around nature tells us there's not really lack there's abundance there are too many leaves there's too much fruit <laughs> there are too many seeds it, God has we're Christians so there it is even if you don't believe in God you look around you see abundance everywhere and man tries to lock things up and, and there's this whole issue of control if communities are able to share if we have a community of inventors communities of artists people who want to facilitate one another communities of entrepreneurs people who help one another that can as, as individuals our lives are richer and as a community our lives are richer and in finance there's kind of an idea that there is a zero-sum game and Don has explained some great ideas to me that there essentially there is no zero-sum game and would you talk about that oh yeah that that's pretty basic I mean you don't have the, the universe is unlimited so why would you have a this whole idea of there's only a set size or a piece of the pie and everybody can only we have to divide this pie up that's what really the whole concept of socialism is based on is that there's a limited amount therefore we have to divide it up and to try to share it equally well even that is a sham because it's really just an excuse to get people to give up their stuff to those that are managing the stuff who end up getting most of the stuff and it you have to, in order for this, uh, such a socialist idea to work, you have to have somebody that's going to be the one that divides it all up and guess what's really going on. It's, it's an oligarchy. It's not anything that's, that's based on equality. And, it, and not to mention the fact that it decreases incentive. If you believe that you're only going to get so much, what's going to happen? You're not going to be as motivated to produce or to come up with good ideas or whatever. That's what we, the stagnation that we saw happen with the Soviet Union. And even though the collapse of the Soviet Union was orchestrated, you did see that dynamic when involved whenever you had the people not being able to reap the benefits of, of their efforts. So, yeah. No zero sum some game, even to the point where we talked of earlier, and this is probably way beyond what most people can accept, and it's hard for me to accept that the idea that elements can be changed into other elements through Brown's gas technology, that to me is a, a huge illustration of it's not even a zero sum game at the atomic level. Things can matter can become other matter. The transmutation of the elements is scientifically possible. So there really is even less limitation than we have always thought. So 
there are those that want to control the game always try to set the limits, define the game. Those that want to take humanity forward have to constantly be learning how to break out of those boxes and to cast off the limitations. Well, I know I've, I've been really encouraged. You helped me to break out of that lack thinking. And Jessica Jones wrote a book called Ask for the Ancient Paths. We just, you know, you wonder, okay, where does this feeling of lack come from if it's not, if it, if it's not founded in reality? And Jessica Jones wrote about kind of the origins of what we call Satan, who was Lucifer, uh, a beautiful aspect of creation. She believes and wrote about his, Lucifer's, perception that God did not have enough love for him to retain his place once Jesus died for mankind and it's kind of complicated but well worth reading the book and considering the idea as being the the origins of lack, the origins of greed, the origins of control that there's not enough to go around. Well, if there is enough to go around, then we don't need to control other people. We can live as free people. And Don and I have been thinking about this with regard to church leadership this week. We've had some things come up that, that Don has been dealing with. And within the context of the organized church, there seems to be this feeling of lack, this feeling of having a need to control, need to direct, instead of allowing people to be free to follow the Holy Spirit according to their own inner voice and, and leading by the Lord. One of the things that's very clear to me from Scripture, if you read the Gospels, is that Jesus did not set up a hierarchy. He had a few disciples that were closer to him, but it was based on relationship. So that's the model that he left the church. But what's happened in the church is we've adopted a hierarchical Roman kind of a, a system, if you will, so that oftentimes you have leaders that presuppose that they know more than the people around them that are fellow believers in Christ. So there's this problem that there's knowledge there that isn't being shared because the leaders don't know that it's there because their presupposition is that it comes directly from God to them and they don't know how to receive it from other people. And granted, there can be a lot of what seems to be wasted time in trying to find that, but I believe that that ultimately is time well spent where we learn to perceive each other as resources of the kingdom and not as automatons to be directed according to a vision that's given in a hierarchical fashion. So, yeah, I think that these, these are self-imposed limitations. These are limitations that are imposed by an old way of thinking that Jesus clearly was teaching people to break out of, but how easily we fall back into them. And in particular, one of the things that I was dealing with this week was the perception in the church that is, seems to be very common that the, it is the purpose or one of the primary purposes of government to keep the people safe. And those people that have any experience in the liberty movement are very familiar with quotes by Benjamin Franklin and other founders who said those that give up liberty for a little security will soon have neither and don't deserve either. And there's various versions of that quote, so I've just paraphrased it. But it's a foundational principle. No, the government does not make it possible for people to have their ministry. They can either stand in the way or not. But ultimately, it's between you and God what God wants you to do. And the government is not a facilitator of that. Don't, don't even look to the government to, to try to... When you've when you got the government between you and God, that's, a, that's as bad as having some... Pope or some <laughs> <laughs> other spiritual leader there. Jesus died to make the way between us and him without any other 
mediator. So it's, it's really quite disturbing to me to see Christians fall into this trap of trusting government to keep you safe because historically we know that whenever governments are perceived as making things safe, what they're really doing is using the mafia con game of, yes, pay me protection money and I'll keep you safe. And, you know, they'll break knuckles and break windows if you don't pay the money. And, of course, you, they won't let you know that it's them that's doing it, but you'll, if you've got any perception at all, know that it's them that's doing it. Look no further than the TSA. How obvious is it that we have this burgeoning tyranny and we don't even many people don't even see what's really going on there so I had just listened to last week Pastor Chuck Baldwin's first in his series of on Romans 13 and the correct understanding of it that all government is not to be slavishly obeyed only the the governments that are correctly instituted by God and that there is a place for Christian conscience. We see that throughout the Bible, throughout history, and in times of tyranny, especially in environments like Nazi Germany, you have this perverted mindset take hold that a good Christian obeys the government. Uh, uh, nothing could be further from the truth, especially when you have a government that is oppressive and taking people's rights away in the name of safety. And actually, in, in various times in, in both of our histories, we've had experiences of intimidation being placed upon us so that we would fall in line and go along with the church's party line. And, and uh, we've had that happen within the last year. And because we're, we're Christians, because we're, we've been taught about spiritual authority, there's, there's kind of this, honestly, there's, there's this fear that rises up and says, oh my gosh, what am I doing? I'm confronting a leader. Well, you know, first of all, Paul confronted Peter and John. And although we think of Paul as, at this time, with the, the perspective of history, as a leader, at the time, he was just this guy that had been killing Christians and then had a conversion. And Peter and John were the ones who were widely known and respected. So Paul was, was taking something of a risk in confronting Peter. You can look it up. I, we won't go into details here. But just, you know, in considering and looking at these types of circumstances, if you're in a church, if you're in the the context of any kind of a group we don't want to bring division but at the same time we don't want to pretend like everything is okay when everything is not okay and would you talk about the differences between Elijah and, and David? Okay but, but first let me say it's it should be normal for the sparks to fly in a healthy way what's unhealthy is you know for there to be honest give and take honest um, expression of opinion honest disagreements and honest working through issues and then we always say in love what does that mean that means a commitment to one another to the body of Christ to the the integrity of each other as individuals that are doing their best before God but you always have the, but what, what is unhealthy is when it gets manipulative, when it gets behind the scenes, when it doesn't get, and that's what happens whenever you bring any kind of a, a facade, any kind of a, a lack of transparency in a situation, the, the frustrations just go underground, they just become manipulative, and that is very unhealthy. So yeah, back to the, the, the contrast between David and Elijah, and this is something we were talking about this week. David was, not a contrast exactly, but it, the historical perspective. David was anointed king long before he came king, became king of Israel. Saul was still king. He had become 
abusive and unresponsive to God, but still did, David didn't raise his hand against him. The, the outcasts and the people that were had lost favor with Saul went to be with David out of the wilderness and Saul pursued him and that went on for, for years and years. David would not raise his hand against the anointed. And contrast to that or compare that to the situation with Elijah when Elijah was a prophet that was in the environment of a very corrupt regime the, of, of King Ahab and Queen Jezebel. So here is somebody who had to openly confront the, the powers because God was telling him that that's what needed to be done. So one of the, the key things about scripture is that there are no absolute formulas. You can't say that the way that David behaved was the, the formula for all situations, that, that David always needed to say, no, it's not, I, I shouldn't oppose Saul because he's been anointed king. One of the things at play there was that Saul was the first king, yet Ahab was the, the one of many in a long line of kings that had degenerated. So you have a different environment, and you have Isaiah being called to that confrontation that was part of his purpose. That was what God had called him up to do. So there, again, really isn't a formula. There is a time for confrontation. Confrontation should not be avoided even if it's not done perfectly, I don't believe. One of the important things that the Lord spoke to me about in terms of how to go about saying things that were not going to be popular is to take the, some of the burden off of the, the, the person attempting to bring the confrontation is that Jesus did not overly admonish people to respect authority and to always make sure that they worded things right so that authority could accept them or perceive them or, or always had to walk on eggshells or sugarcoat something so that the that authority would not find them too distasteful. Jesus placed the burden in communication on the listener. He said, be careful how you listen. That's the opposite of becoming easily offended. That's recognizing that when someone comes to you with something that is likely to make you upset, you do your best to listen. So. Jesus is wanting to create an environment in which dissension is okay, in which disagreement is okay. This is the opposite of a hierarchical yes man culture. And that's the culture that I believe that Jesus is, was communicating to us and has always been communicating to the church and to all people. It's just very hard for us to hear it. So just to be clear, Elijah in case you're not a Bible grabber, as Charlie Sheen calls us, Elijah confronted the king of, at the time, Ahab, and Ahab was very offended, and his wife was even more offended, and Elijah's life was threatened, and it's, it's a great story. It's actually, I think, one of the best dramas that you can read in the Bible. And Elijah is one of my very favorite people in the Bible. So there are times when it is appropriate to bring a challenge, even to leadership. And it's a fine art knowing, knowing the difference, I guess. Although we, we kind of tend to lean toward just doing it, right? You've got to just do it, but we'll, we'll all have our different personalities and our different ways of doing it, and that's okay. That's what I'm saying is, is there's no perfect way to do difficult communication. The only way to fail completely is to not communicate and to stuff it and to, that leads the communication in an unhealthy direction. Sure, and, and that's really an excellent point.
One thing that has been in the news this week, I think we may have mentioned it last week even, was Adam Kokesh and dancing at the Jefferson Memorial. And he had a dance party yesterday. It went pretty well, didn't it? Yeah. Yeah, I thought it was good. We both watched the, the YouTube clip of it that I think was put out by RT. And there were quite a few people there, the more than there were the previous week. And there were park police there. There did seem to be quite a few park police, probably more than the previous week. Gen and the, the, the dancers were all very well behaved and smiling and cheerful and celebrating. And because there were so many, they had to kind of go in a circle around the statue of Jefferson there at the memorial. And they were celebrating, having a good time. Some people were dressed up. And, but you had these cops that were trying to say, now you have to do this, now you have to do that. They were still trying to take control of these of these people that were really, there was really no discord, but the cops, a few of them anyway, just seemed to feel that it was their job to be in charge. It's not like there was any danger, but just that mentality was there. But it was, this was a good example of a good confrontation. This had a good ending. It did. As you like to say about the TSA backing off though when there's when people are becoming aware it's there's this that tension between people more people becoming aware and Adam last week <laughs> being thrown to the ground and thumb choked and and uh, and between having everything go well it's great when everything goes well but it doesn't mean oh we won't have any more interference with our First Amendment rights. Sorry, if you were hoping that. Another idea that has come to us that is not such a good one, we've been learning more and educating ourselves more about Agenda 21. And Don used to tell me that Alex Jones was talking about freeway exits being closed and the, the, how they want to move people into the cities and I would just say, no way, it can't be true, I've never seen a closed freeway exit, which I haven't seen a closed freeway exit, but Agenda 21 is very real and the effort to move people into cities is also very real and that is a great way to become involved at a local level and Agenda 21 is an idea that that will speak to many people who aren't truthers or who aren't aware of what's really going on with government because they can see in their own communities that there's real potential for eminent domain to be proclaimed and people's property, private property, to be taken away from them to fit into these Agenda 21 plans. Do you have anything you want to say? No, not really, just that they're, the local governments are being impacted. They're, you went to, one of the things you mentioned to me was there's a one easy proof that people can do is to, with three clicks, check the connection to the United Nations and this centralized control of trying to herd everybody into the cities. It's all about management, people. It's all about taking away your freedom and making you a managed clone and that you're bad for the earth and you're horrible and they want to make it an environment that's for the bears but not for people. So, uh, no. We don't think that that's the way that the planet should go. And I, I'm really glad you mentioned that about, about bears because, you know, the, the people who are pushing this agenda, this so-called green agenda, I'm calling it the gray agenda because we will find ourselves in gray cities with walls and we will not be able to enjoy or appreciate nature. But the people who are pushing this agenda claim to have a love for nature and the earth I believe that the stronger motivation is really a hatred for humanity and a desire to to make our lives gray. And again, <laughs> Jessica Jones writes a lot in As for the Ancient Past about gray because the, the domain that the legions of fallen angels inhabit is just a gray world. And that's, that's what, what evil would like to impose upon us as well, is, is gray. I like green. CO2 is actually great, great green gas. It makes things green. It makes green things grow. And also, the lady that is kind of educating me about Agenda 21 mentioned that she attended a USDA meeting 
where farmers were being encouraged to join government co-ops that would move their produce to market that the whole, this in effect would place the whole food supply under government control the farms already have government subsidies and they're presenting this idea as a way to save money for farmers and there's real potential here for for us to lose any influence in the in the supply lines for food the the bitcoins idea comes to mind again if if there can be a way that the things that farmers need can be made available through purchases of bitcoins then they're going to want to be able to sell their produce local organic produce through the internet via bitcoins of course you'd have to take possession of it but i'm sure that would be easy to to have some generated number that proves that you bought something and that could be verified the, the, the amazing thing is that the technology is there we just have to begin to make the connections and put people together and then this could be a powerful force in fight in a way of fighting this economy and it, it is ultimately the controllers control of the financial system that makes it possible for them to do things like Agenda 21. The finances, that's at the root. That's at the root of this beast. And we should be about finding ways of freedom around that. The bigger the path we make, the more the path we make, the more people can choose that alternative path, and the weaker that beast system will be. Thank you for that wisdom. And we met with Dr. Noah this week, and he put together some health update ideas for us. One of the primary subjects for discussion was the overuse, the abundant overuse of antibiotics. And I learned yesterday that 70% of antibiotics go to be used in, we talk about the food supply, in the preparation of of meat and we the only way to avoid that is to buy organic meats or become a vegetarian that's we can we can decide whether or not to take antibiotics whether or not to get a prescription we can't really make the decision about about the meat I've got a question if does organic meat also mean that it's not grown with that, that they don't use antibiotics on the animals does Correct. It mean that? Yeah, they okay. don't. They don't use antibiotics on the animals. Okay, so that's one of the things that people need to be careful of is the label "natural," something like that. It there does not carry the weight that an organic certification label carries. And of course, they, the establishment is trying to water that down. But there is a pretty strict definition for what is organic, and apparently, it does include not using antibiotics. Yeah. So here's Dr. Noah to explain the dangers of antibiotics and some other health concerns as well. Welcome, Dr. Noah. Thanks, Don. Cindy, thanks for enjoying Hi. bringing me back there. This is like, uh, like I said last week, I look forward to you guys coming in. What do you got for us? This is a small pile. Well, I know, but we're going to actually go I get some more of my, well, my little binders and stuff, so we'll go a little bit more detail. I, I just thought we'd go over a little bit what's just happened over the last kind of week in terms of what, what kind of interesting to me in terms of what came out on, on the Internet news in terms of health. And so one of the big things, which was kind of, you know, it's, it's kind of sad, but it's also kind of funny to me is that natural medicine, functional me medicine, holistic medicine, one of the key principles is that everybody is an individual mm -hmm. and everybody is unique and you have to have that in your mind as you're a health professional is when you approach someone with a particular type of challenge regardless of what it is and we'll talk about cancer which is one of the more, more ch probably the most challenging factors like that is you're an individual unfortunately the medical profession doesn't see that way oh you've until, got all these codes for all these different categories yeah right? and, and at and some point you've got to try to fit people into yeah the and, and it's pretty much cookie cutter you know hey you need to do 10 10 treatments of chemo like this and and radiation over here and stuff and you know that's like that but anyway but it was kind of funny to me june 3rd which was friday some success seen in personalized cancer treatment so so even there's a concept yeah, yeah because you know as we talked about it maybe a couple times ago the, the so-called war on cancer is not being won 
uh, people aren't getting any better. We've, we showed you from the American Cancer Society from 1930 to the present is that like for breast cancer, survival rate has been pretty much down, you know, it's pretty much a level. There's no major breakthroughs. So let's continue walking and raising money for all this kind of mm -hmm. garbage that doesn't work. But, you know, it makes, makes good press. You've got to do a pep talk every now and then. Well, I know, exactly. Was, we actually got one at the, the hospital that I work at in the, oh, IT, really? in the IT department. Oh, I mean, They really? sent out a big letter saying, hey, you're a part of a great team because uh, we have these, these, you know, couple of really successful results. That they, and it was interesting because it's not any kind of a study. It's like, you're, it's a pep talk. You're a part of a great team, and we've right. got these, uh, you know, two successful patients. Well, that's it. However many. Yeah, thousands you know, of people. Yeah, 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 I mean, yeah, yeah. like we like talked about, what other industry can survive and make trillions of dollars on 2 to 3 percent? We talked about that that big study that was done on chemotherapy, the, fi the increased five-year survival rate for all these expensive hundreds of thousands of, of, of chemotherapy. Do you remember what it was over five years? What was the, 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 the best that, you know, m modern medicine can do for survival of chemotherapy? 2.1%. In five years. Wow. Yeah, I didn't know so that, quite so that, that So that's yeah. like 98%, wow. you know, was not very beneficial. So what other industry can, can exist on having these, once again, random type of things? Sure, uh, miracles happen, you know. And it, It's all based on this perceived superiority of Western technology. That's and right. It's a, it's a bunch of smoke and mirrors. It is smoke and mirrors. So, so that was kind of funny to me. Uh, then in the next, uh, the same day, uh, so, cancer uh, survivors suffer even post-therapy. Well, first of all, we've talked about 95% of cancer therapy from the science shows is, is, has no science and doesn't help. But as you know, they suffer. What do they suffer from? Pain, fatigue, sleep problems, memory, mm. concentrations. Even three to five years after treatment has ended. But they've got drugs for that. Well, exactly. So that's what I'm saying. So that, you know, they never lose. Yeah, yeah. Well, they there's, cause, there's, there's vascular pain. Isn't, isn't that a, a, a friend? Mm -hmm. Her father survived cancer that's right. with extreme Radiation. chemotherapy. Right. But he had, he had constant vascular pain. Women who pain. have you know, breast cancer, and they take the lymph nodes out, they get lymphedema, where they get this terrible pain mm -hmm. and swelling like that. For Once again, the science, I, I just talking to a, uh, actually one of the doctors whose friend just came down with cancer, uh, breast cancer and just said, well, lumpectomy has been shown with at least three to four studies. I know just as effective if you do, you know, modified radical mastectomy, uh, even if you do radiation. And then just that day they came out with a new study saying, yeah, doing, doing a lumpectomy and just doing one dose of radiation is Far superior than anything. I mean, so, so there, you know, maybe there's going to be some time they realize that. This, but maybe this it's crap about the is money. Maybe it's about extracting the money. I don't know. And maybe it's about torture. I don't I know. Don't know. I say, I, that's why I say. I mean, they must hate women because mammography has been shown to be ineffective. And you know, uh, and, and the joke I always give is, you know, well, first what we should do is is scan every man's testicles. Put them on a cold plate, <laughs> smash them together like that, radiate them with ionizing radiation and cause cancer, and then I maybe... I can't wait! Exactly. And then maybe... Doctors the, first. Exactly. That's insane. <laughs> so, and then we'll do that to women's breasts. But no, that's not the case. They'll smash women's breasts together. That's one of the most sensitive type of tissue in terms of ionizing radiation or x-rays causing cancer. We've gone over it. Well, maybe we'll go over it next week. We'll go through all the studies on like that. I mean, it's just tragic. I've never had one. Well, never, good for you. Ever you once. Were. Give me a high five on that one. That's good. You're a smart lady. <laughs> well, I, ca I came close once. I had the prescription. I just well, I know. And because it's all, once go. again, it's, it's once again mild, mind control, brainwashing. They make you fearful. Like, oh, God, don't you don't, you don't want to get breast cancer. Well, we'll go through the science showing that there is no science. A friend on once actually said to me, you don't get mammographies? You're going to die. Yeah, no, no, it's actually the other way away. Every time you have mammography, it increases your breast cancer by 1%. Well, and it's, it's not prevention. Well, of course it's it, not. They call, they call those tests prevention. They're not prevention. The best that science can say is by the, the smallest little speck that can detect with, with mammography, the woman's had cancer for 13 years. How's that prevention? Wow. You've had cancer for 13 yeah. years? Yeah. Oh, that's like me going into a house. Oh, you've had termites for 13 years. This is prevention now. You go, no, it's already too late. The whole house is once again, <laughs> once again, destroyed with termites. No, no, no. I just caught it at 13 years. If we went 20 years, you know, that would have been really bad. No, I mean, the, the mind, mindless type of thinking, just trying to extrapolate this to any other type of industry, people would just say, what are you talking about? How can you have termites for 13 years and that's prevention? It's right. not. And, and what's the impact on these poor people? I mean, it's not just women. It's people who go in for routine colonoscopies. Well, what's, what's the impact of well, the, the, fear, like and, the fear and trauma 
on on you know their their right. their personhood. I, I was telling they're thirty six right. or more hours. Right. Oh my God, do I have ca cancer? I'll find well, out and, soon. And there's studies showing that doing a self examination only delays that by three months. So after 13 years finding it, what's three more months? Nothing, but they make it like a big deal. Oh no, you have to have mammography because you wow. know, having empower women to do their self like that, that costs nothing. Uh, you no, know, but that's three to six months that you can have that cancer longer. What kind of BS is this crap? Yeah. I mean, you know, hey, come on my TV show, any radiologist, <laughs> doctor, and let's, let's go toe to toe and stop this BS. Well, the story I was going to say is, uh, I, you know, I live in Davis where everybody's a doctor, a PhD or MD or DC like myself. The next door neighbor who moved a long time ago, she was a thoracic surgeon. She did uh, surgery. She was a woman. She was kicked out because she wasn't part of the good old boys network, so she had mm -hmm. to leave. But what was interesting, she, she was saying, oh, yeah, I'm sorry to see you go and stuff like that. And yeah, it's going to be kind of tough, but uh, what I'm going to do is to get things started because like doctors, it's starting a new business. I'm going to get a used mammography unit, and I know I can make lots of money real quick. Mm. Oh. <laughs> and I told her, I said, hey, you know that stuff doesn't work, and she just rolled her eyes. Oh. And didn't want to say anything. And stuff. Anyway, so, wow. so like I said, it's all about making money. Oh. And, yeah. ma and, and having the illusion like we're protecting you, we're preventing things, it's a screening, it's total BS. What do you say to the, the argument and the, the widespread perception yeah, right. that... We're living longer because of this great technology. Is that true, number one? No. And, okay. Well, to give us some, some well, substantiate I mean, that. Well, I mean, it has to do in terms of, once again, different types of technology. We, we talked about the large study that was done uh, with, back in the 60s with Beslow. Well, what's the major type of impact in terms of health and longevity? Wasn't pen discovering penicillin, wasn't genetic engineering. It's what's called public health. Mm -hmm. Quality of water, even though as we can talk about all the crap. And now they're, in fact, there's a new study showing not only do they want to put, which they do, put fluorine in there, they want to put lithium in our water yep. now, too. Oh. Great, nice. Oh. Talk about mass medication like yeah. that. Uh, oh. yeah, so, and then there was a British Medical Journal that looked at 160 years, same type of thing as longevity has a lot to do. And to be fair, there is, in terms of what's called acute care trauma, that has improved too. Mm -hmm. In terms of, you know, you work at a hospital, they're very good. You have a heart attack, they have means to stabilize the person where they, in the, in the years past, they would die. But once they're stabilized, then what they do is So what if you better. go back to the period where, in the, I think it's the late 1800s, where you have the public sanitation and, you, you know, the good principles of hygiene, and you didn't have uh, all of the, the vaccinations and all of the, mm -hmm. the junk in your water, et cetera, I have heard that other than the first five years of life and people dying in childbirth, well, that's right. you actually had a longer lifespan. That's right, exactly what I was going to say. Longevity is based on infer, infer, infant mortality. Yeah. And so that, once again, has changed somewhat. Two is, unfortunately, Cal or not California, the United States is like last in that. So that we could talk about that. But when you compare a 65-year-old, 100, 200 years old, to now, actually the people that lived Long, long ago live longer than that. Mm -hmm. So if you're able to survive that first five years, people are living longer because of inf in infant mortality. But once again, that goes back to, once again, good nutrition, you know, different types of, you know, uh, good type of, you know, uh, approaches like that, because that's where the real move is. And the United States is, once again, last on that, even though it's been spent the most money. Uh -huh. uh, the U.S. government changes food pyramid to a plate. And so this has been an issue that's been going on for quite some time, as long as I've been. So we've gone from the, like the basic nine to the basic four to the pyramid, and to be fair, I think they have some some legitimate things. The pyramid is, I think, for most people, too much. So now they have a plate, and what's interesting, uh, I didn't make the downline it, but the, the the what it is is fruits and vegetables, grains and proteins, and then on that little cup is dairy, which I give them some credit because when I was growing up, it was meat and dairy products. That was fifty percent of, and then. Uh, Fruits and vegetables and grains were like that. So at least they've got it down to now where they're going to have basically kind of do that. So we're going to take a little pause here as the mail carrier comes in. All right, guys. Wait, yes, wait, you're going to be on YouTube. Okay. Oh, sorry. Oh, sorry. <laughs> yeah. That's okay. That's okay. okay. That's what editing is all about. Thanks so much. <laughs> and, and part of the problem is that, you know, it, you know, you know, people either become confused or something like that. So, so what I like about it is that fruits and vegetables 
comprise of 50% of what you should be eating, so that's good. Mm -hmm. Then you have grains, which is, and then you have protein, and they don't go into, you know, meat. They say protein, and protein can be nuts and seeds, mm -hmm. you know, other types of protein sources like that. So that, I thought that was kind of actually a little positive thing. So, mm -hmm. so. Yeah. Well, they have to generally keep on track and not lag too far behind. They've got to pick up some new right. ideas in order to, to attempt to stay perfect. Right, exactly. Yeah. That's right. And this is where we're going to spend a little bit more time, is MRSA strain found in dairy and cattle mm. and humans. Now they're found over in the United, mm -hmm. in United Kingdom and Denmark, it is kind of super virulent bug there. And, uh, and so this is, once again, overuse of antibiotics with, with human beings. And, and Cindy was, and I was talking a little bit earlier, which is kind of surprised, 70% of all antibiotics is used in meat production. Mm -hmm. Because these That's animals amazing. are sick, just like you're sick mm -hmm. ah. and using antibiotics. They have to be constantly bathed in antibiotics. So uh, unlike you know, the medical profession who makes money off the sickness, they have to be a little bit concerned. They can't sell a sick cow to be slaughtered. So they're going to lose thousands of dollars. So they've got to pump them with antibiotics at least to try to pretend that they're healthy. They pump them with female hormones, so they bloat up and have lots of water. Mm -hmm. But then they you're have, creating disease-resistant bacteria and that's that, exactly that right. we consume. That's it, right? and, and that's it. Is that MRSA, which is uh, Cindy will maybe talk a little bit. She had an infection at a gym getting it, but most of it was created in, in from the medical profession and also in hospitals because of overuse of, of medication like that. And so that's what's kind of tragic is that this is something that was was found back in the 30s and 40s. You know, antibiotics had a big major impact. Definitely has a, a part to play, but then everything once again. Oh, you don't feel well, Don? Oh, gotta go put you on antibiotics. Cindy, you got an ear infection. We know 90% of that is sterile. Da, 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 da. We'll give you antibiotics. You have a sinus infection. We know 95% of that is not bacterial. We'll still give it to you. So it's just constantly throwing antibiotics yeah. because you know they were just so proud of themselves that they had this super duper thing that was actually had an impact. And if there's something that didn't make them money, they, they wouldn't use it. Well, I know that. <laughs> but 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 it made they wouldn't them, even tell but you. But it about made them it. powerful because now they actually had something that these people would die before, which is not true because there was natural things we can. We'll talk a little bit about the, the 1917 influenza, uh, which killed over 30 million people around worldwide. The, the two groups of people that had the highest success rate were not the drug doctors, were the homeopaths and the chiropractors. Wow. So, yeah. mm -hmm. And we could go about that another time like that, that's but great. let's not confuse ourselves because, you know, that's the facts. Um, <laughs> Don't confuse us with facts. Oh, yeah. man. No, no. You know, the, 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 the reason that human civilization still exists is because the drug doctors are wrong. So because of this misuse, and as we've talked about many times, this is created by the drug doctors. That's where we're at now. Now we have bugs that nothing works. Once again, and, and I'll, I'll emphasize that, medically. Now I'm going to go over a little bit of some other type of choices you have. Mm -hmm. Yes, there's some other choices here. Yes. So let's talk about antibiotics. Because you had this miracle type of thing because of the misuse. Well, here's an article here that was published in JAMA, Journal of Medical, Medical Association. And what they found out that this was a study of 10,000 women, big study, and they found out that uh, those women who, who had more than 25 prescriptions over a lifetime was able to increase their breast cancer by over 200%. Oh my, oh my God! No, this is a miracle drug. Wow. This is only, no, it has a bad side. Wow. And so that's what you have to kind of understand is that everything has a good and bad side. Here's the actual study. Showing it, and from a graphic point of view, is of oh women, my. the more they take it, increasing it to 200. And that's if only if you've taken an antibiotic 25 times. That's right, over a so lifetime. That's if you've had cystitis, if you've had ear infections. Ear as a infection, child. you had bronchitis, anytime yeah. you use like wow. that. Wow. Yeah. Probably virtually everybody. Here, we'll go through, through some of the little myths about antibiotics, just like what Don's saying. Antibiotics are responsible for the decline in infectious diseases. Well, that's wrong. Uh, because most of the diseases were already declined before antibiotics were dis discovered. So from, uh, from this article here, oh, that's right, it's only from the International Journal of Cancer, uh, uh, um, 08, uh, showed that, that basically uh, all, all were in decline for several decades before the in introduction of people and published in a reputable journal like that. So that's, that's just a lie. I mean, that's when it's going to make makes them feel good that they did something. Now, does it have a factor? Absolutely. Um, allergic reactions, yeah, you have to worry about that. Causes destruction of, of, of intestinal, of a good bad type of bacteria, it does. Mm -hmm. And the number it's of, a big deal. yeah, and. A, it, rarely a patient would have a fatal allergic reaction to penicillin. That's right. Wow. But that's not the case. I mean, people have, can have reactions to that. that. 
and as was Don was saying here, published in Science, August two, 1992, is that they've created a resistant species of microorganisms. You have to understand, these bugs are trying to survive. They're little babies that they have. They're trying to keep them from surviving. So they're creating different types of mutations so that this big bad penicillin doesn't come in random bugs sure. and kill them. And they develop, once again, a uh, type of uh, type factor And like they kill that. off the good flora at the same time. Which, which, is, is, which, which is the good part. Huge bad deal. And the reason why this breast cancer occurs is, what's, which you don't know, is that taking antibiotics suppress your immune system. Mm, I didn't know that yeah. either. Because what antibiotics do is nothing with your immune system. Yeah. It, it has to do with replication of the cell wall of the bacteria so that they can't able to reproduce. They destroy the cell membrane. And just like with our, our bodies are like a big bag too. If you destroy the outside and everything pours out, we're dead. That's called hemorrhaging. Same thing as with antibiotics. Uh, we won't go into any more of that. But so, so what are the choices there? Well, I know it's not fancy. Doesn't cost two or three thousand. A lot of the third and fourth generation <laughs> uh, antibiotics that don't work now. I just had a patient one thousand dollars for one dose. Uh, oh, and it didn't work. Oh, who cares? It's, uh, not, it's not my they money. Got the latest and best. Exactly. They feel good about that. And it's free. That thousand dollars came from the money tree. If it costs a thousand dollars, it must be good. Oh, exactly. Mm -hmm. Well, I use oh garlic cure for MRSA superbug. Yeah, that was only published in, in a British from a from a, a Scottish a British journal here. I use a, a, a garlic that before they ship it out, they have petri dishes of MRSA. They have to actually put the garlic on there, and it has to kill the MRSA before they send it That's out. Awesome. So there are solutions, but not from your drug doctor, and doesn't cost a thousand dollars a dose. That's per that's what's again crap. So that's the kind of problem here. So we have this epidemic. People are freaking out because of MRSA, these super bugs, the flesh eating bugs. One, they're caused by the drug doctors, and now they're still making money because when you have that problem, they're they're making hundreds of thousands of dollars of a problem that they caused. And second of all, is there are natural things that work. And we can you know, let Don and Cindy talk about something that was used back before antibiotics called colloidal silver. Oh my God, something simple. So why don't you guys talk gentle. a little bit about that? Yeah, totally gentle. Well, cool. right. I, did, I did have a, I had a MRSA infection that started out small and I put over the counter antibiotic cream on it and Worthless. it just blossomed. Yeah. And it happened to be at a time that Don was between jobs and we didn't have health insurance, so I was on my own in dealing with it. I, I, uh, I started to read the natural Oh my God, <laughs> that's the most dangerous thing. Well, reading <laughs> knowledge, and a woman reading a knowledge, oh my God, that's like the worst thing ever. So I found uh, references to colloidal silver for uh, stubborn staph infections, and started to mix colloidal silver into the body cream that I was using. Shea butter, which and, has been used yeah. in Africa for only like 10,000 years, has its own natural antibiotic, antiviral, antifungal yeah. properties like that. And I had been dealing with the MRSA for probably two and a half months. I used the topical with colloidal silver for two weeks. Exactly. And the gone. infection was gone. Yeah. Yeah. And then we found out that it's really pretty simple to make your own colloidal no, silver. No, 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 no. Oh, I got to buy it from somebody? You have to buy it from a doctor. And we have to charge you $10,000. And we we'll charge Medicare for that. Exactly. You can buy little home units that you create your own, or you can buy them. I mean, if you buy them that someone doesn't want to do that, it's not that expensive. Yeah, I just found some instructions on YouTube. And, and granted, the quality of what I make may not be as good That's as right. some that's bought. But it's still pretty it, it, it works. It works. It works. Well, it's topically. Exactly. You, might, yeah. you might not want to inhale. And Dr. Noah has a fabulous remedy for sinus problems. And it even works on bronchial infections, mm -hmm. doesn't it? Uh, inhaling uh, allicin from garlic and... Colloidal silver, silver and some other things that he makes. Great seeds, uh, grapefruit extract. Blend. Yeah, my little blend. But, but somehow people think it's so old fashioned. Oh, Garlic. Garlic. Oh, that's what the people used to use before they had this well, modern technology. Let's get into the 21st century. Yeah. I mean, that's old stuff. And that's like that's, for vampires or something. Oh, <laughs> exactly. I mean, exactly. I mean, why would you do that? And put You're it not on vampires your, anymore. Or put it on your, your spaghetti. But, you know, let's, let's go to a real doctor. Oh, that's right. They're not real because they don't do anything real. But that's okay. They spend a lot of money, you know, telling you that you should go to them. And then you, our society, once again, goes back to, you know, yeah, this woman, once again, her husband's on Medicare. She didn't pay the $1,000 times 10 that was worthless. The taxpayers, oh, that's right. 
all the tax dollars that you can get from it. Doesn't pay for our debt. And that's a whole different story you guys talk about. That's part of, once again, keeping our society down by being in debt. Mm -hmm. Well, and if, ironically, if we had had health insurance at the time. Oh, you'd have been worse health, off. I would have been at the doctors like that. Yeah. And I, I would have, I would have been mm -hmm. stuck on, in their rut, and they probably would have had to do a culture first to diagnose it, and then I would have, you know, been waiting for the right treatment, and then I but would have been prescribed an antibiotic that, that killed that would, my intestinal flora. That didn't work anyway and because it was once again it was resistant strain. So I was, I was so much better you were off, actually better not off. having the health insurance. Exactly. So I mean, that's kind of <laughs> just kind of crazy. So irony. Uh, Opportunity comes when you least expect it. God, knowledge is power. Who wants mm -hmm. that? I mean, you know, don't confuse me with the facts. You know, just keep, <laughs> give me the same crap. And that's and then that's the sad thing. I mean, I told I think a little while ago I had a woman, you know, that was, uh, you know, her Alzheimer's went away. Of course, you know, that's impossible. Oops. But yeah, that always <laughs> happens with me and my patients, but never with the drug doctors, uh, costing over one hundred fifty thousand dollars, which is the average case for Alzheimer's. Uh, but she had a urinary infection. And, you know, they kept giving her the same antibiotics five times and it never got better. Mm. I mean, what kind of moronic moron doctor is that? Doesn't work the first time? Oh, okay, exactly. <laughs> Let's do it the second time. And just like with your case, third time, fourth time, fifth time, her daughter said, hey, you helped her with the Alzheimer's? Yeah, obviously, you can help it. sure, you can help with that. Two weeks, it was gone. Wow. Using garlic and yeah. colloidal silver and other type of natural, what's called Things that don't, and they don't have consequences for your, your Once again, consequences create more money for them, so they right. love that. Exactly. You have complications, you don't go back to them saying, I want my money back, and now you're going to treat me for free. No, <laughs> we're going to charge you now even more, because now sure. you're even more sick, because I caused that. What other industry does that? Yeah, bottom line is that's what always happens whenever you have a monopoly. And exactly. what you're dealing with that's right. is you're dealing with a medical monopoly. Which we you, all are. Which is 500% big, bigger than the military industrial complex. So that's how big and nasty wow. these quacks are. Wow. Well, yeah. the anti monopoly laws were formulated for Standard Oil, which was owned by the Rockefellers, who also happen to fund Pharma medical schools exactly. and, and own a, lot, a large portion of the And try to destroy all the de natural healing arts like yeah, that. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, look it up. It's called the Flexner Report. Yeah, so that's where these drug doctors came from, mm -hmm. from this corrupt, basically, type of, uh, of, of situation here. Yeah, and they camouflage and morph into all kinds of other things. Well, they camouflage that. Well, now we're really going to have educated people. We're really going to protect the people. Yeah, well, that, that was all BS. Yeah, guess what so the... the the Japanese company Sony. Guess what Sony means? No, what does it mean? I don't know. It's right in our conversation just 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 a minute ago. Standard. Sony was actually started by Rockefellers after World War II. I didn't know that. Standard Oil of New York. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I did not know that. That's yeah. wild. That is wild. That is it wild. Is wild. Yeah. Interesting. <laughs> nice. Thanks. Thank you, Dr. Noah, for helping us to become more aware of those things. And now we will uh, have our pro culture segment, and we <laughs> will highlight some music this week. We've we've been experimenting with some uh, unusual forms of music, and one of the forms that we'll mention specifically is ambiscience. And Don, would you talk about ambiscience? Ambiscience is the maker of a cool little app or, or several applications that are available for for smartphones iPhones and Androids type phones so there are what it does is it, it uses brain entrainment technology and if you're not familiar with that and I wasn't until recently very aware of it now we're becoming more interested in it you know as ways to tap into the human potential ways to Help, your, help you to be more productive and creative. That You may know that brain waves range from alpha, beta, delta, and on down, theta, for going from a, an alert, wakeful state to a restful state to a deep sleep or a meditative state. And one of the abilities that we have as humans that isn't developed is the ability to control the state of the brainwaves that we're in and these technologies can teach you to do that 
and most of them cost are pretty pretty expensive. Some of the CDs that you can buy are the price of a typical CD. The more sophisticated and advanced ones like Holosync and Hemisync that have a, a particular meditation track on it are more expensive. And so they're typically most people wouldn't want to get into it that way unless they had some good experiences or friend with that. We become aware of these through Dr. Noah, our, our chiropractor friend. But I found out this week about the applications that are made by Am AmbiScience and they're only two or three bucks. So it's a great way to find out about the brainwave entrainment, how to that you can teach your body to be more restful or more alert and the, according to the the background sounds that you can mix with different music type soundtracks, natural sounds, rain, waves, etc. or various nature sounds, things like that. While there's a, an entrainment beat going on in the background that you and you can even on AmbiScience adjust the difference in volume between the entrainment track and the, the music track and it can also use your own iTunes uh, songs that are and you can use those as the soundtrack and then bring the entrainment track into that so really really fun stuff and exciting that you can get into this technology for just a few bucks yeah great so if you think you're being beamed <laughs> if, you're, if you're doing some significant work in the truth and, and liberty movement, and you you're concerned about about the government beaming you, whatever. I, we're, no, as Fox Mulder said, no matter how paranoid you are, you're not paranoid enough. <laughs> <laughs> we 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 to a certain degree agree with that statement. So if you if you find that it's, you're having difficulty thinking or feel frustrated or overwhelmed, it's, it's a nice. Mm -hmm. It's a nice way to combat some of that, and even just anxiety attacks, coping with some of the stresses of knowing some of the things that you now know. A movie that we saw that we enjoyed quite a bit was Blind Horizon with Val Kilmer, and he is a, it's unclear if he's a government killer or a contract killer, but he seems to have been under a certain degree of mind control, and he's becoming aware gave it away a little bit there because you have Val Kimmer escaping from some people that may be killers, you don't know what they're about, and he's trying to warn of a killing, and then later you find out that he might have been involved in a killing, and he has these flashes of awareness that really looks like it's basically a mind control kind of a setup. So if you like suspenseful movies, enjoy Val Kilmer as an actor, like we do, and are interested in what dynamics of mind control might look like in an assassination attempt, then this is an interesting movie. We enjoyed it. Yeah, it was entertaining, and we're kind of Val Kilmer fans. We saw a film the other night that was called Stone, and probably not for very sensitive people to watch. An interesting story about some sociopaths. But the news this week did have some big sociopath stories. We had this thing with this wiener in the photograph that he somehow sent or tweeted or whatever it was and him denying it and then and some people saying well this is they're just trying to squash this guy because he's trying to stand up to the the banks and expose corruption and uh, but uh, frankly, I, I think it's better just to see this as the psychopaths dominating the sociopaths. They always have dirt on anybody, and this dirt happened probably somewhat accidentally, but it was also managed in order to control this guy who is not not a good guy. He's he's in the system. He's not somebody that is fighting for constitutional liberties and there's infighting and the, the the big dominant psychopaths will always dominate the little sociopaths and so unfortunately that's the political culture that we're living in and we encourage everybody as dark as that is you have to be able to recognize that this is the other thought that I have is that you can be 
optimistic about the future and you can be controlling your mind and have a great thoughts about human potential, but if you're not recognizing reality, you're not going to get results. So it's not only learning how to think correctly about your own potential, but it's also being able to recognize reality. And when you have a culture in decline, you get a lot of aberrations in thinking and people thinking that they can control reality by their thinking. And one of the things that's more and more clear to me is you have to re be able to recognize reality and then empower your thinking to deal with the reality, not get under the illusion that their thinking can control the reality. It can only help you deal with a correct recognition of reality so that you know how to fight the battles. Robert De Niro and Ed Norton. Edward Norton. So Edward Norton plays a, a man in prison who is a sociopath or a psychopath, a very manipulative type of an individual, very messed up. Robert De Niro is his, I'm not sure exactly what his title is, he's like a parole officer, he's a person that analyzes him to recommend whether or not he should be paroled early. And then you have the, the, the wife of the Edward Norton character also playing into that, seducing the, the Robert De Niro character. So it, there are very interesting dynamics, very, very good acting, and it is disturbing. It, it, it doesn't, the movie isn't great because it kind of leaves you expecting a greater climax than actually happens. So the thing to enjoy about this movie is the dynamics of the sociopath and the the way that Robert De Niro is played and then discovers he's being played and tries to figure out how to react to that and with those things in mind I think you'll enjoy it. And we saw a very entertaining, uh, very very fun, we were, one of those films that surprised us and the title of the film is Chaos Theory, and I had been seeing it in the Netflix Watch Instantly lineup for a long time, and the jacket and the blurb on Netflix just do not do the film justice. Do you want to talk about your enjoyment of the film? Chaos Theory doesn't have any big actor names. It's kind of an independent film, <clears throat> and it's very enjoyable. The blurb about it says that these are there's events that happen in this man's life because his wife sets his clock backwards instead of forwards and all these things happen and but that again doesn't do the the film justice there there are these different circumstances that happen to this the main character who is a a, a time management specialist or e efficiency specialist in which he goes through all this self-evaluation about how important that is and how he embraces chaos in, term, in, in replacement of time management. And one of the great, great statements in that film, the real take-home message of the film was that love is, that, that we live in a chaotic in universe. This is chaos. And he used to say, you've got you've to fight the chaos with being organized. And that's you know, otherwise you're going to be defenseless against this chaos. But he comes to this conclusion, he says that the love is the most unchaotic thing in the universe because you personally choose to love and choose to be loved. So it's the most unrandom thing is deciding to love and to be loved. And I thought that was just wonderful worth a movie to see that philosophy being played out through really humorous circumstances, really good acting, very, very enjoyable film. Yeah, it's, it's really the kind of film that I would, that I could watch a few times and, and still find enjoyable. I think there's some things in there that I, I would be able to mine if I watch it second or third time. Another film that we recently watched was The Accused, for which Jodie Foster 
won an Academy Award, well, for her performance, not for the film. And it's a, it's a dark film, again, not for the very sensitive, but it's a, it's a very, very good film if you enjoy Justice courtroom films. I hadn't seen this film. It's a 1980s film, I think 1988, late 1980s. And Jodie Foster plays a rape victim, and you get to see the scenario under which that takes place and the ease with which the system wants to let rape victims off the hook. And it's you mean rape perpetrators, not victims? Rape perpetrators off the hook. And the and or not give justice to the rape victims. So it's worth watching for the dynamics, the great performance by Jodie Foster and the seeing the legal world around that. One of the interesting things to us watching that movie, and whenever we watch older films like in the 1980s and anything before the mid-90s, we tend to notice differences in the culture. And one of the differences in that movie in the late 80s was the independent local news reporting of the, the events of the, the trial, the, the, this local trial that was a big story. You have some lip service to that kind of thing these days, but it's more and more rare. What you really get from the local news channels these days is stuff that's fed from the top down. You have this agenda that's being managed at the local level instead of local stories being picked up and managed locally and local competition between the different news sources at the grassroots level. That thing just doesn't happen any anymore because you have this very tight, centrally managed global control that reaches all the way down to the local level. So it's worth watching a film like that just to see the difference in the culture and to, to see the, the way the justice system should function when you have somebody, that a lawyer, that really does end up wanting to give the victim justice and to compare that to the system that we have. It's, it's really helpful to help us to see where we've fallen from in such a short time. It's a, it's a very good film. We encourage you to watch that. Again, not for family viewing because of the rape content, although I would say it's, it's not until the end where you, where you actually see that event and then it's not handled graphically in that you see body parts. So I wouldn't say that it necessarily has to, to have a, you know, somebody needs to be mature to watch it, but it's not uh, pornography by any means. Well, thank you for joining us this week for Pearls of Liberty, and be free. Free, free.